Hello, so let us solve the problem now. So we know that the function f is continuous on the whole real line. On top of that, we know that f of 0 is equal to f of 2. This means the height of the graph of function f at the point where x is equal to 0 is exactly equal to the height of the graph of the function at the point where x is equal to 2. We want to show the existence of at least a number a, which is in this closed interval, so that f of a is equal to f of a minus 1. To solve this problem, I want to use a famous theorem, namely the intermediate value theorem. Okay, uh, let me remind you about the content of this theorem. This theorem actually asserts that if you have a function h that is continuous on the closed interval, for example, from a to b, moreover, if we know that h at a multiplied by h at b is a negative number so from these two you can conclude the existence of at least a number like c in the open interval from a to b such that f uh, such that h calculated at c is equal to zero okay Understanding the content of this theorem graphically is very simple, but to prove it rigorously, one needs the completeness axiom of the set of real numbers, which is, of course, beyond the scope of this course. So let me just draw some graphs for you to motivate you about the simple content of this theorem. So, for example, assume that this is my x-axis, and this is my y-axis and then for example let us consider that this point is a for example and this point here is b i want to concentrate on the interval close interval from a to b so let me just drop some vertical lines from these two points and concentrate exactly what is happening in between my function h is a continuous function on this interval. So what does it mean? It means that if I want to draw the graph of function h on this interval, I can do it with one pen stroke. So I can start from a point, go continuously, and at some other point. So I start somewhere here, for example, if this is h of a, and then I draw a continuous curve, and then I have to end up somewhere on the other line. Okay? But there is an extra condition here, and that is h of a times h of b is negative. This can happen if and only if either the first one is positive, the second one is negative, or the first one is negative and the second one is positive. So let us concentrate, for example, here, in which h of a is positive, but h of b is negative. What is the meaning of h of a b positive? It means that the value of the function at point h is a positive value. Okay, so this means that h of a is a positive value. So assume that from here to here is h of a. But now we, I assume that then h of b is negative. So for example, h of b is here. So this is the point and this is another point. If I want to draw the graph of my function starting from here, going to there continuously without having the right to lift my pen from the paper, then it is inevitable I have to cut the x-axis at some point. So it doesn't matter how I go. When I want to go from here to here, I at least have an intersection point with the x-axis. And that is exactly the number C claimed in the theorem so you see this c is in the closed uh, in the, is in the open interval from a to b 
The other scenario, of course, is that this one is negative, this one is positive, but it doesn't matter, yes? Here, I start from a point lower than, below the x-axis, but I have to go somewhere above the x-axis. So again, it doesn't matter how I do it, I have to cut the x-axis at least at one point. But here, of course, you see that I have this cut more than one point. But the existence of at least one of them is guaranteed by this theorem and that is the content of the intermediate value theorem so it is an extremely powerful theorem which is of theoretical importance so whenever you want to solve approve deep theorems in mathematics in analysis mathematical analysis you usually use this intermediate value uh, theorem Okay, now let us start solving the problem itself. But again, before starting solving the problem rigorously, I want to draw some graphs for you to motivate you uh, about the content of this problem. It's actually very simple and nice, so you can, it's a, it has a very nice geometrical interpretation. Okay, so let me just draw my x-axis uh, this is my x-axis and I also draw my y-axis here and then uh, so let me this one is 0 because you see that the numbers are involved are 0 1 and 2 so let me highlight them on my x-axis so let me take three grids to be 1 for a clearness of the picture so and then this is 2 so the function f is a continuous function so it means the graph of the function can be drawn with one pen stroke there is another condition that i have to respect if i want to understand this problem is that the height of the graph at these points zero and two are the same so for definiteness of discussion so let us for example assume that this is the height yes for example assume that f at zero is this point and assume that f at 2 is also this point so that they are of the same height. So let me highlight them, for example, here. So this is point uh, f of 2, and here it's this point. So the graph of the function f between this inter between 0 and 2 starts exactly at this point and goes continuously, but it has to end at this point. This is something we know according to the problem. So let me make one simple case, for example. Let me change my color here and then draw one of these possibilities. So for example, assume that this is your graph. So assume that this is the graph of the function that the graph of the function f of x only on the closed interval between 0 and 2. Okay, what is the claim in the problem? The problem claims the existence of a point A, at least, in this closed interval. So this closed interval is somewhere from here to here. So this claims that you can find an A so that f of A, the height of the graph at A, is equal to the height of the graph at A minus 1, one unit less than A. For example, to understand it graphically, so let me just put a point here for you. So do you think, for example, uh, uh, this point can play the role of A? Do you think this is plausible to say this is A? Let us check. If this is going to be A, which is claimed by the problem, then it means that f of A what is f of a? f of a means that I have to start from a and go vertically upwards so that I intersect the graph of my function. From here to here is what we say f of a. Now I go one unit less. So one unit less is actually here. Yes? And then this will be my a minus 1. And if I ask you what is f of a minus 1, you do the same thing. You start from this point and you go vertically upward so that you intersect the curve. And then you will tell me this height is f of a minus 1. But now you see that this height and that height are not equal. So this 
is not one of those A's claimed by the problem. Okay, because the heights are not the same. But the problem claims that you can find at least one A with that property. So where that A is, we can explore it here graphically with some demonstration here. So let us try to, for example, understand this problem. So let me take a line segment with one unit of length exactly. So assume that three grids is one unit. So let me just try to do this. So this is my uh, line segment of length one unit. And then I want to take this one and put the left hand side of this on this graph. And I want to concentrate between one and two. Yes, because this is what we are concentrating. We want to look at the graph of the function between one and two. And I want to make sure that there is such an A here. I do this. I will move this line and put the right-hand side somewhere on the graph here. And I start moving this so that this point is always on the graph. And then I want to see that really this happens, that at some point, the, right, the left-hand side also lies on the graph. For example, if I take this with me, uh, for example, here, you see it is not working. But if I start moving, moving down, you see now it works. Yes. So if I ask you, uh, so it is a little bit uh, of scale. So let me just try to see what is happening. OK, I don't know. When I move this one, it changes the size, which it shouldn't. OK, but let me bring it a little bit lower. Yes. OK, so let us assume that. OK, hopefully it works. OK, so what happens now? This means that you see, if I choose this point here to be A, if I ask you what is A minus 1, because this is one unit, you will tell me, yes, this is A minus 1. But now look, the height of F of A and the height of F of A minus 1 are exactly the same. So yes, this point is the point in this interval and the existence of such a point in this interval is demonstrated graphically here. I hope that you understand the content of this simple but nice problem. Okay, now we want to prove this rigorously. So we want to prove rigorously the existence of such an A in this interval. Okay. I start with this. I say that if we consider some possibilities, one possibility is that it, it might be the case that f of 1 is equal to 0. So I would say if f of 1 is equal to 0, we are done. Why is that? Because 1, a is 1 in this case. We want to prove the existence of a number in this interval. 1 is indeed in this interval. And if you say this is true, so this means that f of a is equal to f of a minus 1. So we are done. Similarly, if f of 2 is equal to f of 1, we are done. Why is that? Because... In this case, I give the role of my a to number 2. 2 is still in this closed interval. And if you tell me this is the case, then f of a is equal. What is 1 then? It is a minus 1. So in this case, 1 plays the role of a. In this case, 2 plays the role of a. So in these two special cases, I am done. So the hard part of the theorem is that what happens if neither this one is true or, nor that one is true. So I would say that, so, assume that uh, f of 0 is not equal to 1, f of 1, and f of 1 is not equal to f of 2. Okay? 
we want to still show that this is still possible to find an appropriate a okay so how can i do that but be careful f of zero is not f of one f of one is not f of two but still f of zero is equal to f of two i would define a new function here i would say that let g be a function defined by g of x equals to f of x minus f of x minus 1. Okay, first of all, I want you to understand that this function g is also continuous everywhere. Why? Because f of x, according to the problem, is continuous everywhere. f of x minus 1 is essentially the same function, but it has been shifted one unit to the right. Okay? So this means this is continuous, so its shift is also continuous, and the difference of two continuous functions is also a continuous function. So g is definitely a continuous function. You have to write these things in the exam, but let me just uh, save some time. I talked about that orally, so I would say that let me just write this. g is continuous everywhere. Okay. On the other hand, let me now calculate g of 1. What is uh, g of 1? g of 1 means go here and replace x with 1. So then it becomes f of 1 minus f of 0. But because of this assumption, this quantity is not 0. So this means that I can say that this is not equal to 0. Let me do the same thing for g of 2. g of 2 means replace x everywhere with 2. Then what you get is f of 2 minus f of 1. But you also know that this is f of 1 is not equal to f of 2, so this quantity is also not equal to 0. But on the other hand, you know that f of 0 is equal to f of 2, so instead of f of 2, you can put f of 0. So let me just continue. So this becomes f of 0 minus f of 1. I can factor a minus sign out, so this becomes f of 1 minus f of 0. Now what I want to do, I want to multiply the left-hand sides of these inequality, oh, equalities, so this I also multiply the right-hand sides. So what happens? This tells me that g of 1 times g of 2 is equal to this quantity multiplied by that quantity. But you see this is exactly the same thing. So this becomes this to power 2. But I have extra minus sign here. So this becomes minus f of 1 minus f of 0 to power 2. On the other hand, because this is not 0, this is not 0, so the product is also not 0. So on the one hand, this quantity is not 0. On the other hand, the quantity is negative of an even power. So it is a not positive. OK. So because negative of an uh, even power is not positive or non-positive and on the other hand we know this is not equal to zero so then it means that therefore g of 1 g times g of 2 has to be strictly negative okay now do you remember g is continuous everywhere when it is continuous everywhere, g is also continuous on this closed interval 1 and 2. So, g is continuous on the closed interval 1 and 2 because it is continuous everywhere. On the other hand, g of 1 times g of 2 is negative. So, I hope that you remember this is the content of the intermediate value theorem. So, this guarantees the existence this means there exists a number a where 
in the open interval 1 and 2 such that g of a is equal to 0. That's the content of the intermediate value theorem. But what is the meaning of g of a? g of a means I have to replace x with a everywhere. So g of a is just f of a minus f of a minus 1. So this implies that I can translate this. This means f of a minus f of a minus 1 is 0, which means uh, f of a is equal to f of a minus 1. So you see, either this one is true, we are done, or this one is true, we are done. Even if none of them is true, a little bit harder or more complicated, we actually was able to prove the existence of an a in the open interval 1 and 2 so that this works. Of course, if a belongs to the open interval, automatically a also belongs to the closed interval. Yes? So this is a stronger condition than a being in the closed interval 1 and 2. So this actually uh, ends the solution to the, this part of this problem. Okay? Solve the second part now. My solution is different from the solution of the examiner and is based on a theorem called Rolle's theorem. This theorem is introduced and proved on page 142 of the course book, Calculus, a complete course by Robert Adams, 10th edition. Okay, let me, before starting, let me recall you about the content of this theorem. Let f be a function with three properties. The first property is that it is continuous on the closed interval a and b. The second property is that it is differentiable on the open interval a and b. And the third condition is that f of a is equal to f of b. This means that the height of the graph of the function f at point a, at the point whose x-coordinate is a, is equal to the height of the graph of the function at the point whose x-coordinate is b. Okay, if these three conditions are satisfied, then there exists a real number c in the open interval a and b such that f prime of c is equal to zero. Of course, the rigorous proof of this claim is not that hard and it is, as I mentioned, presented in the course book. Okay, so I will take this for granted. But before leaving, let us try to understand the Rolle's theorem from geometrical points of view. So let me just draw some graph for you so that you can see that this is more or less uh, intuitively clear. So let me just draw my x-axis and then pick my points a and b on the graph and then let me just draw my y-axis here. But because f of a is equal to f of b, let me fix this height. For example, let us consider that from here to here is f of a and from here to here is f of b, they are equal, yes? Okay, so I want to concentrate uh, between these two numbers. So I am just looking at the graph of my function between these. So while we know that f of a and f of b are equal, so my graph should start from here and end at this point that you see. Okay, so let us, for example, draw the graph of one type of these functions. Okay, I have a lot of degrees of freedom for drawing this curve, but I have to respect two things. First of all, I am not allowed to lift my pen from the paper because I do not have any discontinuity on this interval. The function should be continuous, so I should draw the graph of that function on this interval with just one pen stroke. And differentiability on the open interval guarantees that there is no sharp point on the curve of this function. Okay? And then, of course, what is the content? What is the claim? The claim is that there is a number on the open interval 
for which the derivative at that point is equal to zero. So this means that at some point within the open interval A and B, I should have a horizontal tangent. For example, it is clear that I have this horizontal tangent. And the x-coordinate of the point of tangency plays the role of C, which is actually claimed in this problem. But of course, you can see that in this graph, I will have more than one C. Because, for example, this is also a horizontal tangent. So the x-coordinates of this point can also play the role of the claim C in the problem, uh, as well as this point. So in this case, I have three uh, numbers C in this interval with that property. But Rolle's theorem guarantees the existence of at least one of them. Okay, now that you know uh, the content of the Rolle's theorem and have a good understanding uh, of it from geometrical point of view, so let us go and start solving the second part of the problem. So let me just put the problem here in front of your eyes. So we have, we want to prove this. Okay. The proof, I am motivated by this relation. So I define a function g as follows. Okay. I define g of x to be this. So you see that these coefficients a0, a1 over 2, a2 over 3, up to a n over n plus 1 is exactly these coefficients that you see here. So I define this function. First of all, you see that this function is a polynomial without any constant terms. Yes, because all the terms that you see are involved with the x variable. And the degree of this polynomial is n plus 1. Yes? So this function is a polynomial. We know that every polynomial is continuous and differentiable on the whole real line. So this means that this function that I introduced is co uh, continuous on the closed interval 0 and 1 because it is continuous everywhere and differentiable on the open interval 0 and 1. Okay, but on the other hand, we have two more conditions here. So you see that I want to prove that the function g that I defined here satisfies the Rolle's conditions, the conditions for the Rolle's theorem. There are three conditions. Continuity on the closed interval, it is correct. Differentiability on the open interval, that is also correct. The next thing that I need to show is to show that g of 0 is equal to g of 1. How is that possible? Very simple. g of 0 is actually 0. This shows the direct calculation shows that immediately because if I replace every appearance of x with 0 then definitely I will get 0. So g of 0 is equal to 0. But what is g of 1? g of 1 is also 0. Why? Because if I replace every appearance of x with 1 I get this expression but this expression is guaranteed to be zero by the assumption given in the problem itself. Okay, so now what is the conclusion? G of zero is zero. G of one also is equal to zero. So what can I conclude? I can conclude that G of zero is equal to G of one. So I hope that you agree now that the function that I introduced satisfies the three conditions of the Rolle's theorem. Namely, g is continuous on this interval, g is differentiable on this open interval 0 and 1, and finally I also showed that g of 0 is equal to g of 1. So now Rolle's theorem can help me to conclude that there exists a number c, this symbol means there exists, this means belonging to, so there exists a C belonging to the open interval 0 and 1 for which G prime of C is equal to 0. But let me elaborate a little bit about this. What is G prime of C? If I want to calculate G prime of C, I have to go to my function G, differentiate my function, after differentiation I replace every appearance of X in the derivative with the value c. So I need to differentiate this function. 
but this is an extremely simple function to differentiate. That's just a polynomial. For example, the first one, its derivative becomes just a node. The second one becomes 2x, but that 2 coming down, cancel this one. I am left with a1x1 and, and so forth. So this is the result that you get. This is your g prime of x. But now, what is g prime of c? So it means g prime of c is 0. What does it mean? It means that when I replace x with z c, I will get 0. Yes. So this condition that you see here, this condition implies there exists a c in 0 and 1 such that this is equal to 0. Why? Because g prime of c is exactly this expression that you see here. So let me just repeat. g prime of x is this one. I know that g prime of c is 0 for some c in this interval. So this means that if I replace every appearance of x in the derivative of g, I will get 0. I did it here. I replaced every appearance of x with c and I got 0. But now compare this one with the equation that you are supposed to show it has a root at least in this interval. Okay, we showed that because this comparing these two, you can see that x has been replaced with c everywhere. So this means that c, which is in this open interval, is a root of this equation. So we were able to guarantee the existence of at least one root of this equation in this interval. Okay, so I hope that this video was useful for you. Until the next video, be safe and goodbye. Thank you.